here we are, very quickly, you come to a gate like this, and you have to go inside. Um, what are these catacombs? Probably never, many of you have never been to these before. What are they kind of all about? Well, they're vast underground burial sites. And right now, there are about six that are open to the public, and they're really very, uh, very heavily frequented. They get about half a million visitors every year who come out, um, and they go stand in line and get taken down. Um, this is uh, Calixto, I think, Calisto, uh, for a little kind of 20-minute circuit underground to see what these catacombs are all about. This is me shooting illegally um, on the fly, because they don't let you take pictures. So, <clears throat> of course, they do. Uh, and you get there, and they give you lessons about the beginning of the Christian church, right? And the beginning specifically of the Roman Catholic Church, right? They tell you the sacred history of this Roman Catholic Church, right? We're going to look a little bit at that history and a little bit at the story that they tell and a little bit about how that relates to Judaism in the ancient world. So we'll start with the basics, right? What are catacombs? <clears throat> well, they're underground burial complexes that were used from the late third century on, because at that point, burial space on the surface started to get basically all used up, and used for a very long time, it's a very old city, uh, and what was left was very, very expensive. So they started to move underground, and of course you could just keep digging and digging and digging underground, and you have a lot more space once you turn there. So around the third century we find this move. There's no religious reason for them to move to underground burials. It's, it's purely economic. <clears throat> They're the burial places of about one and a half million Romans. Right? A lot of people. In use for about 200 years, there's all kinds of interesting and complicated reasons for why they end after about 200 use, years, uh, probably the most important of which is sort of the move to the Christianization of the empire and uh, the sack of Rome, which means that the city walls no longer keep uh, a, a margin between the living and the dead, and then they start bringing the dead inside the city walls, partly for protective reasons, uh, and the pattern of burial changes. And they extend for miles. They go outside the city walls from about 800 BCE. There are clear prohibitions against burying the dead within the city walls uh, in the Roman Empire. So if you go outside, following any of the major roads that lead outside uh, of the empire, you're going to find burial spaces there and uh, catacombs underground. <clears throat> and they're huge. Right? You have a complex that might be as many as seven miles for a single complex. Uh, of underground tunnels on as many as five different levels. Right? Very, very big complexes. Now here's the big question. If you go to these major catacomb sites in Rome, um, they will tell you these are Christian sites. Absolutely without uh, any question whatsoever. So, well, how do we know there were Christian sites? Right? Um, is that a question? Um, are they exclusively Christian? Here's the real and honest answer that they don't actually give you on these tours. The answer is yes and no. Right? So we'll look at that a little bit more closely. Now, how do we know that they are predominantly Christian? And I'm not even sure I want to say they're predominantly Christian, but we're going to hold on to the large Christian catacomb sites are predominantly Christian. I feel safe saying that. When you go, you get a little lesson about Christian iconography and the type of symbols that were used at the time, right? And uh, they will tell you about the meaning of symbols like this, is like the anchor and the fish, very common early Christian symbols, the key row, the first two letters of the Greek word for Christos, for Christ, okay, uh, pretty Christian a symbol, uh, and the ichthus, the fish, you see this on people's bumper stickers and stuff uh, still today, right? The ichthus fish, because the word ichthus in Greek, the fish, can also be read as an acrostic, right? Saying Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior in Greek. So rather than putting, I am a Christian, on their stones, which is expensive to carve out all of that, right? They would just put a little label, yeah? So this is the way that it's always kind of read. Well, these are Christian labels. There's also other things like material culture that you would find. Here's a beautiful piece of gold glass. It's the bottom of a ceremonial vessel. Uh, and these were always found in a mortuary context in Rome. And here's one to St. Agnes. And you can see 
Agnes in front, you can see it's less visible in this, but Peter and Paul uh, on either side. So the three patron saints of Christian Rome. So again, if you find this in a, Christian, in a grave, you can say, well, that's probably a Christian grave, right? Okay, so you come across a stone like this, and would you say this belonged to a Christian? What do you think? Yes, yes, okay, yes. Uh, look, there's the anchor. Look, there's the fish, right? It actually says living fish or fish of the living there at the top, which is pretty useful as kind of pointing towards a Christian. Also, problematically, it has the DM at the top, which means um, this grave is sacred to the gods of the dead. Uh, and it's actually a pagan formula. So this is one of those things where they don't usually point out the DM. Um, but okay, we'll go with Christian. Um, you come across this stone. Right? Okay, we say this is Jewish. Why is it Jewish? Right, so it's got Jewish symbols on it. Right? So you see it's got a uh, menorot on it, right? There's also uh, other things, sort of etrogim, right? There's the lulavs, there's like palm symbols. We've got different things which we associate with Judaism, recognize as Jewish symbols. And so we can say, pretty unproblematically, if we come across a gravestone like this, that it belonged to a Jewish individual, right? Yes? Good, okay. But here's where it gets interesting. Okay. So the Christian catacombs of Rome are sites which are today still curated for the most part by the Vatican. In fact, they're run by a pontifical commission that has existed uh, since the 19th century, and they trace back to one very influential man. His name is Antonio Bosio, and he's known fondly in catacomb circles as the Christopher Columbus uh, of the catacombs. Now, he was not a priest, he was a layman, uh, originally actually from Malta and not from Rome at all, um, but he was very deeply pious and he was an, a great explorer, a sort of spelunker, uh, an underground catacomb explorer, and he was one of the first people um, who lowered himself down in the pits right, into these hollows they had not yet been excavated to see what was there um, and hang out. Um, had some good experiences, had some pretty terrifying experiences down there with 30,000 bodies, you know, and candles that were running out and um, tombs that were bigger uh, than imagined. He did not necessarily treat these catacombs in a particularly reverential way, so we have a lot of Bosio's own um, graffiti that he would leave when he was there. You can see up at the top. So this is done with candle soot. Um, they're bored, they're down there, they're having a, a, a good time. Um, but it was Bosio who first started the sort of science of formally excavating these catacombs, right? And then it was other influential ca ca Catholics of his time, or the, uh, an order called the Oratorians, um, who would see these mass burial pits as early Christian shrines, particularly martyrial shrines, right? And evidence for the earliest, purest form of Catholicism, right, in Rome. So because of these people, the Oratorians and Basio and his friends at the Vatican, right, these mass burial pits became transformed into sacred sites for prayer and for vigil, right? And they would go down there and they would spend time overnight, they would also clear them out, take all the bones out, take everything out, install altars, right? Go down there for masses, go down there for prayer, right? This was not what they were used for in antiquity, but this is what they were used for after the 16th century. They also um, hired a group of men known as the Corpo Santari, uh, who were essentially grave robbers, right? Who were paid by the, by the church to go down and pull out the graves, to actually smash open the graves, take out the bones. And you know what they did with those bones? Sold them as relics, right? Because every church, in order to be consecrated since 787 AD, needed a, a, a bone, a relic, something in order to consecrate it, to turn it into a church. So these catacombs became the site of a an absolutely massive and thriving relic trade as they went into these catacombs, smashed open the graves, took out the bones, said these are the bones of our holy martyrs, right, and took them out and sold them. And they, they're still around, by the way. They actually show up in churches even in North America. Sometimes you go and you find like little bits of bones. Uh, I have a bad thing for like going into churches and behind churches and 
opening cabinets and finding bones. Um, I really like tracing the history of this thing. Um, okay, so now I'll tell you a story. In 1604, go back to 1604, the vineyards and the farm pastures beyond the Tiber and the city's western gates, okay, here we're in the south, the Porta Portuensis quickly gave way to a kind of escarpment. I don't have a picture from 1604, but I got one from the turn of last century, and you can kind of see the landscape. Um, you see how this bit of an escarpment there, this part? sort of western part of Rome there. Um, the escarpment's friable hills, right, like most of the surrounding areas of Rome, had been given over in antiquity to burials. And young Antonio Bosio had heard from his friend, Zaretino Castellini, right, that there were nestled into these sort of natural caves that you see around the side of this site, um, ancient catacombs that could still be accessed. So he and Castellini went and explored one site that had just sort of come to everybody's attention, but he and his pals were left sorely disappointed. The catacombs that they found were shabby and uninteresting, this is his account, because they found no sign of Christianity, again I'm quoting him from this in this catacomb, but instead just a few painted menorot over some graves, and a broken inscription with sort of part of the word synagogue on it, Bosio agreed with his friend Castellini that the catacombs were Jewish. The first Jewish catacombs, in fact, that had ever been identified in the city of Rome, okay, 1604. Then, after removing some items of casual interest, pocketing them, um, and leaving behind some caustic anti-Semitic graffiti, Bosio and his pals left. Now at this moment, 1604, this is important, at this moment the myth of the Jewish catacomb was born. Okay? The Jewish catacomb, I'm going to argue tonight, is an invented entity which persists in scholarly literature and popular understanding until this day, but which has rarely been subjected to critical analysis. So my argument today is pretty controversial, but I maintain that the adjective Jewish when it's applied to certain catacombs of Rome, is as misleading as the adjective Christian right, when applied to a similar set of Roman catacombs. Furthermore, it's misleading for a kind of series of interconnected reasons, all having to do with how we see and identify religious identity in the Roman Empire and what investments we, as modern scholars, have in doing so. So uncovering the real story of the Jewish catacombs requires a brutal stripping away of centuries of acquired detritus, of assumptions and biases, attitudes reflected starkly in Bosio's anti-Semitic graffiti, but also in the naive assurances that these sites do indeed reveal something about late antique Judaism. So what I plan to do today is tell you a little bit more about the backstory, right, of these two major Jewish catacombs in Rome and why they can't be used as they have been, to reconstruct the social history of the Roman Jewish community in antiquity. Instead, I'm gonna suggest other models for being Jewish in Rome 1600 years ago, models that depart starkly from earlier, more normative um, concepts of Jewish community. So let's come back to the phenomenon of Jewish catacombs in Rome. Bosio's exploration in the Monteverde catacombs in 1604 was the first time Jewish catacombs had been discovered, but by 1928, some time later, six or seven others had been discovered in the city. So um, Vigno Randanini in 1859 in the south uh, by the catacombs of San Sebastiano, a small one near Vigno Cimara in um, 1866, another small one here off the Via Appia Pignatelli, uh, there is another one, a uh, small Jewish hypogeum in the um, Via Labicana, and two burial complexes now counted as one um, there to the north in the Villa Torlonia. So today only the Villa Torlonia and the uh, Vigna Randanini sites exist. All the others have been lost. And of those two that are open, one you can get into, if you know me, huh. um, one you can't get into, if you know me, um, so there you go. All right, so <clears throat> let's begin with the sort of the issue of how do we know that the catacombs were Jewish? Well, Basio says he found at Monteverde um, no evidence of Christianity. So the first thing is a sort of criterion, a, a negative criterion, right? 
But what was he right? Was he right about this, right? What would he have needed, if he goes into a catacomb and sees only one menorah, to say that the entire complex was Jewish, right? How much material evidence do you need from a complex to declare the entire thing Jewish, right? One tomb with a menorah, right? Ten tombs with a menorah? The majority of the graves with some sort of Jewish symbols on it, right? Um, for Basio, I think this is a key point, for Basio, he sees one menorah over a grave, and he concluded that the entire complex had to be Jewish, right? Because in his way of thinking, where you find one Jewish person, you find many, right? Because they're always together. Well, why is that? Because the only social model that Antonio Basio had for conceptualizing Judaism was based on the Jewish ghetto of Rome, which had been instituted in 1555. So right from his birth, really, he'd grown up to think that Jews always were banded together, right, in one place. Where you find one Jew, you find them all, and so therefore, if you find one menorah, the entire complex has to be Jewish. Well, I don't know about this, so I think we're, we're going to hold on to that for a second. He made this determination without ever fully exploring the catacomb. He didn't go in, right? He only went into just a few um, uh, vestibules of it. The other thing that uh, made the site count as Jewish is that you do have Jewish iconography, right? You have at least one point of, of, of iconography in it. So together, the sort of the lack of any evident Christian materials that he saw in it and the lack of the existence of uh, Jewish material made him say that the entire thing was Jewish. Well, okay. I, I think to imagine that because you have one Jewish tomb, the entire complex is Jewish, um, is a kind of unfortunate way of thinking. Because it goes back to this idea that Judaism was more or less self-consciously a pariah religion, right? A separate culture that closely policed the boundaries of its own community. Now this idea, which is really more assumption than fact, right, has colored even otherwise excellent scholarship on Rome's Jewish people. Um, perhaps influenced by Max Weber's assessment of ancient Judaism. So here's a little quote um, from Max Weber on this, right? Sociologically speaking, Jews were a pariah people, right? Which means, as we know from India, that they were a guest people, right? Who were ritually separated, formally or de facto, from their surroundings. Now, that term guest people, gastvolk, while never explicitly applied to the Jews of ancient Rome in modern historiography, nevertheless undergirds that assumption that the Jews never really assimilated in the city of Rome, despite having been settled there for hundreds of years. Right? It doesn't accurately represent modern Judaism, and I don't think that it accurately represented ancient Judaism either. Furthermore, here's where it gets very upsetting. Because the Monteverde catacombs were poor and broken down, in Bosio's estimation, it had to be Jewish because the Jews were a miserable and accursed people. I'm quoting him, okay, on this. Because they believed he, they had murdered Christ, right? So that was, in essence, what he had written in graffiti with his pals that day before he left. And so this is why, after Bosio walked out, unlike the Christian catacombs to the south of the city, the Monteverde catacombs were completely abandoned in the early 17th century, so much so that knowledge of where it was exactly was eventually lost. Okay, so let me return to the Christian sites. So if just a few Christian or Jewish symbols on a few tombs made the Monteverde catacombs Jewish, what guarantees that the Christian sites were wholly Christian with no Jewish people ever buried there? Well, in fact, this is not the case at all, and there were bits of Jewish artifacts or artifacts with Jewish symbols on them in the Christian catacombs. But what happened to them? They were simply removed and put into private collections without, notice, without noting their provenience, right? We know they're there because we know that these things were discovered in the 17th century prior to the discovery of the first Jewish catacomb, right? Where else did they come from? So if all the Jewish materials were taken out from the Christian catacombs and set aside somewhere, right? Moved into private collections. Why were they doing that? The answer comes back to the relic trade. 
In the 17th century, it engaged a furious business. The relative accessibility of the catacomb sites posed a problem for the church. Anybody could get into there, right? And the church tried to uh, control the flow of so-called legitimate relics against the unscrupulous dealings uh, of private relic brokers. So papal officials were well aware of the many opportunities for fraud, and it only made the, the church more vulnerable to ridicule from Protestants. So an apostolic decree of 1668 under Clement IX established a custodian of the sacred cemeteries and relics. Papal edicts sealed off catacomb entrances, seeking to staunch the sacrilegious passing off of bones of an Italian, un ladro, un assassino, or forse un ebreo, right? So that you can't get the bones of a thief, an assassin, or maybe a Hebrew, right? The grouping of Jews with thieves and assassins not only underscores their despised status in papal Rome, but also the pressing need, apparently, to insist that Jews had never been buried there. Right? So the isolation of Jews from Christians and burial sites was then not due to any Jewish preference to maintain separate burial grounds, but the categorical claims of counter-Reformation Roman Catholic Church that such a thing would have been monstrous and contaminating and therefore could never have happened. So this is really no surprise in the city that had turned against its ancient Jewish population. In 1553, copies of the Talmud were publicly burned on the city streets. Pope Paul IV's establishment of the ghetto on the city side of the Tiber separated the Jewish population forcibly from its neighborhoods, neighbors. In 1577, Jews of the ghetto were forced to endure obligatory sermons and the strenuous attempts to convert them, which could at its most egregious result in the kidnapping of their children and their forced baptism. And in 1625, Pope Urban VIII forbade Jews from marking their graves at all. Okay. So thus persisted throughout the Renaissance and the early modern scholarship a desire to ghettoize the catacomb evidence as well. The expurgation of Jews from Christian sacred sites of burial, the celebrated home of the church's first native martyrs, was only the last and most pernicious act in a vicious history. Okay, but now I'm gonna fast forward over 300 years because by this time the situation for the Jewish population in Rome was somewhat different. At least the ghetto no longer existed, having been closed in 1888. And quite by chance in 1904, oop, look at that, I've got another catacomb, another sarcophagus. All right, I don't know how that fits. But uh, in uh, 1904, the Monteverde Jewish catacombs were once again discovered this time through a different entrance. So it was quickly discerned that from considering Basio's sketches, the ones that I had shown you from Roman Sotarania, that this was the very same complex that he had discovered, right, in 1608. But here's what's really interesting. It was no longer so definitively Jewish. The early 20th century excavators, were a German team, um, as it happens, discovered besides Jewish graves, Burials bearing images of Christograms, that's the key row that I showed you before, those first two letters. Signs uh, as well of non-Jewish, non-Christian burials. Um, there's some lamps bearing images of Aphrodite, for instance, on there. Okay. Excavations continued from 1904 to 1919. What happened there is actually really kind of fascinating. So the Jewish materials were removed to one collection, right? Christian materials and others were moved to another collection, right? So thus parsed out into very tidy categories, we lose precious data, right, on the shape, so to speak, of a mixed late antique burial complex for people of only very modest means, these people who did not have much money. And then, in 1928, the entire Monteverde site collapsed into a massive sinkhole. So nothing remains of it today. Um, if you go, and Rome took these from Google Maps, you see where that point is, the gray point right in the center there. Um, that's, we think, where it was. Um, and now I kind of give you a, a, a close-up. And it's now where, I love this, where the very Ya yeah Fitness Club is. <laughs> um, although, this is exciting, um, about two years ago, um, some of it was discovered by a truck. Um, yeah, so, you know, that, things like that happen in Rome all the time, which is why you have to love the city. It's like, oh, the truck fell into a hole. What's in this hole? Oh, look, the lost Monteverde catacomb. Um, 
So it, was great. And it happens all the time. It's right. A cat discovered one a couple of years before that. Some guy was chasing his cat. Cat disappeared and went in, and it was like, oh, look, another catacomb. We didn't know about this. Um, it, no pun was intended in that. Um, okay. The interesting case of the Monteverde site, however, does not end there. Okay. Scholars persisted in insisting that it had a Jewish nature and making substantial assumptions about what sort of Jews were buried in it, right? Um, where they worshipped in proximity to this burial, right? This data came largely from a set of inscriptions, about 207 of them, which were associated with this site. Although, weirdly, most of these were not actually um, provenance to the catacomb itself, right? It's supposed to be black. Um, many held on to the idea that these inscriptions came from the Monteverde area or the adjoining neighborhood of Trastevere. Um, after all, there's textual evidence um, for a Jewish community in nearby Trastevere in the first century BCE uh, in the wake of Pompey's triumph. Um, at as late as the early modern period, there were still Jewish burial areas by the Porta Portuensis uh, and the remains of a medieval synagogue. I had an apartment right next to this one here. It was lovely. Um, you see this beautiful old synagogue there. It's a medieval synagogue. Um, how can you tell it's a synagogue? You can see that central column there. See the close up? Yeah. So that's one of the only kind of clues that we know that this was uh, a synagogue. It's, um, it now has a beautiful restaurant in it. You should go, if you're in Rome, it's called Spirito Divino, uh, the sort of the spirit of wine or uh, kind of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it's a pun in Italian. Uh, and if you go, you have an amazing meal. And um, if you ask the, the proprietor very nicely, he will actually take you down into the basement and so you can see um, the remains uh, of the foundations of, of the synagogue, which is kind of cool. Uh, last year, the New York Times did a piece uh, that 38 bodies were discovered um, in very good repair, dating to between the 14th and 16th century. Um, this is in Trastevere by the Tiber. Um, this was on the site of what we know was um, the, the Campus Judeorum, the um, Jewish cemetery, which was closed in the 17th century to make way for the extension of the city walls around it. Okay, so this measurable Jewish presence in the area, right, first century BCE, again, 14th century, 15th century, 17th century, um, accounts for the widespread assumption that ancient Jews lived primarily in Trastevere, right, where they remained for nearly a thousand years. Um, in reality, there is no solid reason to support this. Now, ancient Jewish burials have been discovered not only at Monteverde, um, but really kind of scattered all over the city. So you can see this on this map. So we, it would be absurd to think that they all lived in uh, Trastevere, which is thereby um, sort of by Monteverde, um, but they buried their dead all over the rest of the city, right? They were probably also living all over the city. So let's return to the inscriptions. So many of the Monteverde Jewish inscriptions are, are not actually from the Monteverde catacomb. They were assigned to it because their original source was lost or lost. Right? In fact, we know that some of these inscriptions were known even before Basio discovered uh, the Monteverde Catacomb because they're embedded in the walls of monasteries and churches across the city. So where did these come from? So without shadow of a doubt, I would say they came from Christian catacombs. Right? Again, remember it wasn't until like, 1604 that we had that first Jewish catacomb. These were put in the walls earlier than that. They're stones that were known earlier than that. Uh, where else would they have come from? But here's what happened. Whenever a Jewish stone appeared from the excavation of a Christian catacomb, it was removed and put into something called the Sala Judaica, the Jewish room, which was part of the Vatican collections at the time. And in fact, that collection still kind of exists if you go to the Vatican today. So this is the modern Vatican museums. Um, and if you go, there's one little corner of it. And here you've got the modern Sala Judaica right here. Now, this is very nice from one perspective. You go and you go, wow, look at all these Jewish catacombs, these Jewish inscriptions all together, right? But they give you the sense, right, that they all came from the same kind of a place, right? They create that sense of a sort of ancient community, and that ancient community was there and was thriving, which is true. Uh, but they were put there from all kinds of different sites. So we can't really use them to get back to a sense of um, community. But people do. Now here on the other side of town, this is the, the beautiful synagogue uh, from the 19th century as well. A gorgeous site. And if you go into the synagogue museum, they also have 
a lot of these Jewish inscriptions. I'm sorry I don't have better slides than these. But they take the Jewish inscriptions, sometimes the exact same ones, these are copies, they're not real, uh, as at the Vatican museums, right? And they put them all together, again, to say, look, right? Here is evidence of a robust Jewish community, and it's usually done in the singular, a robust Jewish community that existed in Rome, right, in antiquity. I'm not trying to say that there were no Jewish people in Rome in antiquity, I'm gonna make that clear. What I'm trying to say is there was not one single Jewish community that was self-isolating, okay? The idea of this comes again from this modern impression which is given from the way that these are um, put all together. Okay, so I talked about Monteverde quite a bit. What about the second major Jewish catacomb in the city at Vignerandanini? Now, does this not give uh, evidence for a well-defined cohesive Jewish community? <clears throat> it is presented that way, uh, and I know that a number of people here uh, in this room even have been to this catacomb and have gone to a, a tour uh, of Randanini, and it's absolutely presented as a Jewish um, catacomb, a Jewish site. You can go and see it if you're very lucky. Again, if you ask me, um, uh, it doesn't ordinarily give tours, but there's one tour guide um, who, will, uh, who will let you in. I will say that the Vatican that uh, sponsors, pays for, underwrites the Christian sites has no interest in paying for the Jewish sites, and so these um, continue to be underfunded. Uh, they don't have kind of, you know, a big population of people who go to them. They don't have money, and they really depend on people's donations um, to go and pay for the tour uh, so that they can keep basic sort of up, upkeep uh, of these sites. They're... Um, uh, sort of on their own, really, which is really quite sad. Okay, so if you go in to Randonini, it has a really kind of interesting history. This is sort of the entrance down to it, and you'll see this is dated from 1868, right? The site is across from the Via Appia uh, and directly across from the major Christian catacomb site of San Sebastiano. Right? Mirroring the experience that Basio had uh, you go down into this catacomb through kind of small entrance. It's over on this side now, although it crosses the major roads at some point. You go down, and uh, it's relatively small. It's all on one level. And one of the first things that you come across is the grave that looks like this. Right? Very simple painting of a menorah on a white background. Here's another kind of big one. So this site was once very rich in artifacts, and in fact, the owner of the lands on which it stands attempted to sell it on its discovery to the Vatican, but there was too much Jewish material in it for the Vatican to be interested, right? So the owner turned around and he tried to sell it to Baron Rothschild, the, the, the wealthy Jewish banker, um, to the popes and others, uh, but the Baron found that it actually wasn't Jewish enough for him, right? Um, so the, the kind of jewel in the crown of this catacomb is this double cubiculum here um, from the back of it, and you can see this very nice um, uh, 3D image that's been done on it, and I can, so that's kind of what it, I don't know. If you could, if it were transparent, <laughs> this is what it would look like, but if you're standing inside, you see uh, it's very nicely painted around there. The peacock is a pretty standard symbol, uh, Roman symbol of the afterlife. And up at the top, the ceiling tondo, you got this image here of a winged victory who is crowning a nude male athlete. And in the other one, you can see an image of Fortuna, goddess Fortuna, carrying a cornucopia full of stuff. I think I've got a kind of closer up image. Um, so these are beautiful, but um, they don't feature any Jewish iconography at all, right? So since the Baron didn't want it because it wasn't Jewish enough, right, and the Vatican didn't want it because it wasn't Christian enough, um, the Rondoniti decided to set it up as a kind of a showpiece, a kind of a tourist attraction uh, that was a Jewish catacomb across the street from the Christian catacombs, right, to catch the pilgrim traffic as it came down um, that way. Um, and in the process, he did his own sort of sorting out of the artifacts, most likely kind of purging any religiously ambiguous artifacts that were in there along the way. So what we have at Randonini, then, is hardly a pure, uncontaminated site that offers proof of Rome's ancient Jewish community. Instead, it's virtually a Jewish theme park of the dead, right? <laughs> Much in the same way that the Christian catacombs present 
theme parks um, un of the unambiguously Christian dead. The Randonini catacombs feature a number of inscriptions which are still in situ, which is one of the things that they um, feature in there, uh, all of which display marked signs of Jewishness, right? So either Jewish iconography, you've got like this one here, right? Or um, the specific use of honorific titles. This is uh, Castricius here who is a grammateus, right? Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but here's the kicker. These stones were not actually there originally. They were replaced there in the 19th century when the site was reopened as a Jewish showpiece site. So it's kind of no real surprise that all the inscriptions are unproblematically Jewish, right? Uh, because they'd all been sorted and selected specifically for those markers and then placed strategically along the galleries at eye level, right? There's another one, so you can, as you're kind of walking along, they're, they're placed at nice intervals where there's a little bit more room and the tour guide can stop and shine a flashlight because there's no electricity in there and give a little lecture, right? That's why they're there. They're not actually over graves at all and they don't correspond to the graves that are there in that site, right? Hmm. Okay, so if these Jewish catacomb sites are really not to be trusted as authentic evidence for Jewish community in ancient Rome, what can we say about Jewish people and Jewish lives in antiquity? Well, here's where science can help us. Okay, so the Jews of ancient Rome were simply not segregated in one area. That's one thing that we know. Oh, look, we've got another one. Okay, this is kind of out of sequence. I will show you this one because you see how it's not actually on a grave at all? This is a grave cover. There's a grave. There's a grave above it. There's a grave on the other side, right? Um, but they put it there at eye level, right, where you can see it and stop and read it. So it's not associated with this. It's not really actually a tomb at all. And there are no bones um, in these. The bones have long been taken out. All right. So science can kind of help us, I think, in learning something uh, more about this. So l this is Leonard Rutgers. He's a, a Dutch professor who's done a lot of work on the catacombs. He works primarily on Villa Torlonia in the north. I'm not talking about Torlonia today because you can't get into it. Um, even Leonard Rutgers can no longer get into, uh, into the site. Um, and I don't want to talk about something that I don't have access to. But from all my conversations with Leonard, uh, what I'm saying applies just as well to Villa Torlonia. So it's not like that one is um, an outlier. But he has done a lot of scientific testing, specifically of the bones and the teeth of skeletons that he has um, tested from Villa Torlonia and also from the Christian catacomb of Calixtus in the south of the city. So he's tested the bones and teeth of over 5,000 graves right, over the years. And what he's found is actually really interesting. The two sites, one in the south of the city and one in the north of the city, produce virtually identical patterns of mortality and disease. Right? They also were drawing on the same water sources, something that you can tell from the isotopic analysis in the teeth. So very interesting. So if you looked at um, studying the teeth, say, of uh, the Jewish people who were in the ghetto um, in the 17th century, the makeup of their teeth is sort of the isotopic analysis is different from people outside the ghetto because they're drawing on different water sources, right? Um, so you can tell where people are living in the city. And what the show is looking at this Christian catacomb in the south and this Jewish catacomb in the north is that they're all living together in the city, right? So he says, right, that's when it came to the physiology of life and death, right? Jews, pagans, and Christians confronted the same sort of realities in ancient and late ancient Rome. The reason they did so is simple. Instead of living wholly segregated lives, right, they intermingled all the time which seen from a purely demographic perspective, the integration of the Jews of ancient Rome into contemporary society appears to have been nothing short of utter and complete. Right? So the reality then is this. Roman Jews were virtually impossible to see as a separate community from any literary, legal, archeological, and material evidence in imperial Rome. But nevertheless, the scholars persist in confusing evidence for Jews in Rome Right? which certainly existed, with evidence for a Jewish community in Rome. So let me emphasize, our Jewish catacombs in Rome do not give evidence for a Jewish community in late antiquity, and they do not reflect a Jewish community. They reflect only a concerted effort, largely driven by Roman Catholic apologetic aims, to ignore 
or erase evidence for ancient Jews and Christians living together in favor of reconstructing ideologically sites that appear to show Jews in self-isolation. Jewish catacombs themselves are not the only archaeological evidence that's been used to construct a Jewish community in Rome. Epitaphs are central as well. So a few scholars have put together volume collections of epitaphs, but the key problem with that is um, the sort of the assumption that the most important thing that determines the Jewishness of them, besides obvious Jewish symbols, is their fine spot in the Jewish catacombs. So if you say, well, these Jewish catacombs weren't actually Jewish, then we kind of lose some of that rationale. Now, what makes a Jewish epitaph other than that, right? The presence of Hebrew on it, which is very, very rare. The only Hebrew they seem to have known was Shalom, which they write at the top of some. Um, they preferred the Greek language. Uh, they might have uh, biblical names, Judah, Sarah, um, Jewish symbols on them. We looked at that. Certain formulae, which are perceived as Jewish, here lies so-and-so. Who knew that that's a Jewish formula? Right? Here lies so-and-so. We use it all the time still. Um, or in peace be his sleep. The Christians are using these two, but not exactly the same. Uh, and the mention of a synagogue or synagogue position. There are a lot of synagogues that are actually mentioned in that, and that's kind of interesting thing that, again, seems to point to Jewish community, right? The existence of Jewish community. There are um, somewhere between 11 and 14 synagogues that are mentioned um, uh, distinctively on this material, and you can see them listed down one side there. Uh, the Jewy numbers there, Jew is the Jewish inscriptions of Western Europe, volume two, uh, which has the kind of funny acronym of Jewy. Um, so we call it Jewy two all the time. People are looking at me like, what are you talking about? But it, it actually really is how you would pronounce that, right? Jew two. Um, so there were a number of synagogues, but the synagogues to me don't prove anything about um, community. Three of them seem to be named after neighborhoods, which is interesting. So um, uh, you have um, the, the Campensis Synagogue refers to the Campus Martius, the Elea Synagogue to the south, and the Synagogue of the Superensians to the Subura in the center of the city. Otherwise, synagogues are associated with a specific ethnicity or a native city, right? One may point to an occupational group, right? The synagogue of the Calcarisians means the lime workers, right? But it's important to emphasize that the sole evidence for synagogues in Rome comes from these inscriptions. We don't have textual evidence for them. We don't have archaeological evidence to support them. Um, so without that, I think it's unwise to imagine actual synagogue buildings in Rome. They may have existed. We know that they did in other places in the diaspora. Um, but they may have been small household meeting sites rather than freestanding designated meeting spaces. Or they may have con existed only conceptually. That is, a synagogue was a group uh, of Jews who came together for worship, and then after they went back to work, it sort of disbanded in this way, right? Um, like an assembly, people. The existence of 11 different synagogue names also doesn't mean that in the fourth century that Rome had 11 different synagogues, right? Uh, it's based on the assumption that all the inscriptions were contemporaneous. What if one's there and one disappears and then another one disappears, it appears at a different time. So we have to be very careful with the synagogue inscriptions. The other thing that's interesting about them is that they really liked titles, honorific titles. And a lot of them have these honorific titles, and furthermore, the honorific titles that they use are pretty specific to Rome. So Roman Jews are using these titles for one another that, that weren't used elsewhere, and we don't know anything about what they corresponded to, right? So you find um, Melarchon, right, which le literally means about to be archon. It's on this particular one at the bottom. Um, also common is Grammateus, I showed you, Castricius' stone already. Gerusiar, pat, pater of the synagogue. Um, sometimes they're only just free-floating. This is true of Grammateus, this is like a, presumably a scribe of some sort, but maybe just somebody who was literate, I don't know. Our youngest Grammateus died at the age, age of six. Right? Um, so kind of funny that uh, he holds uh, kind of too much of a position of authority. Um, titles are occasionally associated with a group rather than a synagogue, like somebody could be an archon of the Tripolitans rather than an archon at the synagogue of the Tripolitans. And, and these honors were held exclusively by men. Right? So all the ones we have um, are just for men, except for there are three to a mater synagogue. So, these titles and honors were obviously important to the Roman Jews, just as they were to non-Jewish -Roman, non Romans, 
Um, but as for something like yearning for an ancestral homeland, that's not clear. Following Torah, learning or knowing Hebrew, again, there's no evidence at all. And to be frank, I wonder how easy this would have been for Jews in Rome, particularly for slaves. We take freedom of religion perhaps for granted nowadays, but in, in Rome too, at least in theory, you have freedom of religion. But freedom of religion is for people, and slaves were not people. So if a Jewish female slave, let's say, wanted to have her son circumcised, she probably could not have. Her son wasn't hers, was her master's. She couldn't do such a thing without his consent. And how would she find and contact a moil or somebody who has the knowledge of how to do this, right? How could she pay for it? Where, where, how, how would this even happen for a slave living in a city of a million people at the time? So I don't say... I don't say this to say that Judaism was impossible in imperial Rome, but it faced difficulties that we don't often think about. And there's more to it than that. I don't want to take away, say, the Jewishness of that woman slave just because she wasn't able to follow the laws of the Torah. What we do find some evidence for in Rome, and it's textual rather than archaeological, is evidence that Jewish men, and probably women, honored Jewish law by observing as they were able to under the circumstances. For example, numerous Jewish pagan, or numerous Roman pagan male elites wrote of their Jewish male slaves fasting on the Sabbath. In fact, that's one thing that Roman pagans thought they knew about Judaism, right? They, they worship, the Jews worship one God and they fast on the Sabbath, right? Um, this is because Jewish male slaves weren't in the position of not being able to work on the Sabbath. They had to work, but they could at least control their food intake, right? So under the Roman Empire, being Jewish in Rome meant, to a great degree, assimilating, being both Jewish and Roman, living fully integrated with non-Jews, and having some customs and rights that made sense to them in a society obsessed with social standing and the bestowal of honors. Some put Jewish symbols on their tombs. Others did not. But that still made them Jewish, right? They're just invisible to us today. We'd be very foolish to say that those Jews who put the Jewish symbols on their tombs were the only Jewish people. If they were, we'd only have about 500 of them across um, uh, Roman antiquity of the thousands that there must have been in the city in the second century that reached a million people. So I've offered tonight a revisionist picture against those who imagine a robust, self-isolating, single Jewish community in Rome, missing the temple and holding fast to their ancestral identity. I suggest that Jewish people in Imperial Rome might not have been unlike Jewish people in modern America. Some keep kosher, some do not. Some have their kids bar mitzvahed, but mitzvahed. Some do not. Some know Hebrew, many do not, right? It's no conflict to be both Jewish and American, just as surely it was no conflict in Rome to be both Jewish and Roman. In fact, I'd venture that the boundaries of Jewish identity are both now, but also 2,000 years ago, negotiated daily at the level of family and the level of the individual. And that, it seems to me, is part of what a covenant is all about. So if indeed I'm wrong that there is no such thing as a strictly Jewish catacomb, and the Emperor Constantine was right in the fourth century when he stated that nothing hallowed and Christian could be held in common with the murderers of the Lord, then the segregation of the Jews into their own burial spaces was hardly their own doing. The phenomenon of strictly Jewish catacombs from late antiquity should not be held up as acts of strong community policing their own boundaries to restinct, retain their distinct society creds, but rather as the remnants of the first Jewish ghettos, the result of nascent Christianity's unforgivable act of matricide. On the other hand, if I'm right, and the Jewish catacombs is the long result of an early modern Christian attempt at containing a fluid and thriving religion into a containable form so as to preserve intact a pure and judenfrei early Christianity, then again we might consider abandoning both their fantasized Judenrein spaces and our celebration of a distinct and self-isolating Jewish community that in reality was born of early modern prejudices. So I invite you then to rethink these spaces with me and to think beyond these established boundaries to find a different model or different models by which Judaism could flourish in ancient Rome. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and I got through without coughing. Yeah. <laughs>
from these tombs themselves, there are certain names that are given to slaves, a certain kind of burial patterns sometimes, that these people were probably slaves. And Christians are holding slaves as well. So, so Jews don't suddenly all get freed as a people. Yeah, the catacomb, what bothers me is, if the Christians are being buried there, and the Jews are being buried there. Yeah, do you want to talk about the microphone? The Jewish cemetery? And who gave them the right to be buried there? Who gave the Jews the right to be buried there? Yeah, we Why wouldn't they have the, the right? Because Christians are being buried there. Uh, yeah, and pagans are being buried there. There are, there are no laws that say people need to be buried according to their religious affiliation in Rome. People were buried according to their family. So if your family purchases the land, then you can be buried in that land. And this is kind of what's interesting about it, because a lot of the scholarship that you read, they say you weren't buried according to your religion, except for the Jews. Right? And it's always set up as this kind of exclusive thing. Well, the Jews did it. it and there's nothing in Jewish law that says the Jews need to be buried apart from everybody else either. Um, so the evidence doesn't show that, in fact. And the pattern that the Jews are following is exactly the same as the Christians and the pagans. That's according to your family and who's buried in your family. That's, that's the, the main thing. Could you pay for a grave? Um, and did your family buy it? Yes. Can you identify the symbol at the bottom of that, uh, of this script there? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it's supposed to be an open Torah scroll. But you said before there was no scroll. Right. Um, I don't know that that's an open Torah scroll. It looks and like matzahs. <laughs> yeah, you know, it does look like matzahs. You know, so there you go. Could be. We don't know what it is. And as sometimes you see the closed Torah scroll, which is just like a rectangle. And people go, look, it's a closed scroll. I, I don't know. So yeah, maybe it is matzah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I think the microphone's going back. Yes. And then Susan, there's a gentleman. I, in the I was surprised on what you showed as third century CE to see Greek instead of Latin. How late yeah. was Greek used in Rome? When did it phase out and turn yeah. completely to Latin? That's and a, for that's that matter, when did question. Italian start? When did Italian start? Ooh. Uh, Italian starts later, though you start to see kind of signs of um, vernacular low Latin in late antiquity, like 5th, 6th century in some of these. The, the um, Earliest Christian inscriptions are also in Greek, um, and all the Jewish, not all the Jewish stuff is in Greek. Um, the majority of the Jewish inscriptions are also in Greek, and they seem to end by the fourth century. Yeah. We do have Latin ones as well, and we have these weird hybrid ones where it's actually uh, Greek written in Latin characters, or Latin written in Greek characters, which is completely freaks out my graduate students when they're looking at this stuff, and they spend sort of like, what is this, until they read it out, and it's like, oh, in pocket hole. Oh. Because uh, it looks completely weird in Greek. Um, so, so they're very bilingual. And it seems to kind of phase out in fourth century when Latin becomes dominant. Yeah. But it's a mark of Jewishness to use the Greek. Yes? I was wondering, because of the <coughs> low status of the Jewish people in ancient Rome, yeah. were they persecuted by the Romans the same way the Christians were persecuted? Were they yes. put into the ring, eaten by lions? <laughs> Not that kind of persecuted. Um, they were expelled from the city and expelled from Rome on a number of occasions. Uh, but sometimes that gets sort of pointed out as being the way that it always was um, for the Jews in Rome, as opposed to just kind of moments, bad moments, w where a certain group was expelled. And the Jews were, but other groups were uh, as well. They were not explicitly um, persecuted in the same way that Christians were. They had freedom of religion. And the Romans, again, believed that, the, that, in fact, had respect for Judaism as a whole, as a religion. Uh, there's certain things they quite liked about it. Uh, Christianity is illegal because they see it as political dissidents. They didn't see it as a religion. So it was a little bit different um, in that. However, when there are persecutions under Nero, and we don't know how true all this was, um, the, there's some question that maybe Nero was um, actually putting Jews to death or Jews or Christians to death. It was very early, right, um, following the fire in 64. So um, that's one instance where there looks like there was persecution, imperial persecution of Jewish Christians at the time, maybe Jews, maybe Christians, if that actually happened. But we don't know. 
It, it wasn't a systematic persecution. It was Nero because he was crazy um, that he did that. It's like, light up another Christian. He used them as torches. For his, it was, Nero was that. Um, um, I, I guess just in talking about the sacred versus like kind of the mundane or the profaneness of the spaces, yeah. specifically like of the catacombs, if yeah. you could talk about um, how like during the time, like uh, like during the contemporary period, like when the catacombs were being used about how they were being used by the people, like were the catacombs visited? Cause you said like some of them, like the tombs were removed and then they had altars built. Like yeah. were both kind of like religions or all three like, using them or were they kind of like reserved as like cemeteries and then not visited again? Yeah, this is a wonderful question. And my thought, my thinking has really changed on this. When I did my first book, which was about 12 years ago, The Bone Gatherers on this, um, I assumed that the, these were sacred spaces and that people went down in antiquity for vigils, people went down um, to pray, people went down to visit their dead. Um, I've since decided that's actually not true, and that's one of the, the myths that we have about catacombs. I don't think they were visitable spaces. They're pretty nasty. Uh, they're pretty small. I mean, they're nasty kind of now, uh, and they don't have bodies festering in them. Um, so imagine when they're doing burials all the time um, and you're underground with, with rotting bodies and they, nobody really likes to, to be near a rotting body, you know. People were different about that 2,000 years ago. So I think just the, the fossors, the diggers went down, they would dig the spaces, they would put the bodies in and they would backfill as they went because otherwise it's a pain to get all the soil up and out to the surface. Uh, and that was just, that wasted too much of their time. So they would dig one and they would just fill it up as they dug the second one, and nobody was really going down there. But um, I say that, and like five of us think that in the world. Everybody else thinks they all went down and, <laughs> and prayed. And, but. Um, my first question was also about uh, the Latin and Greek inscriptions. Mm -hmm. Were there any uh, Aramaic inscriptions? No. Uh, there, are, there, there are bits of Aramaic on a few stones, maybe about four that we have uh, out of the entire corpus. And they seem to have belonged to people who came from further east. Um, but they're not, yeah, they're irregular. They're very rare in that. And they don't seem to be from native Romans. They seem to be people who came through. OK, my other question is, uh, how much DNA research has been done? Very on little, very little. Um, uh, Rutgers has been the person who's been doing the, the research, and it's not been DNA, it's, it's been the, the stable isotope um, research on it. Um, and I wish there were more. The Vatican doesn't support testing bodies. Uh, it holds that they're sacred bodies, and, and they can't actually um, be used for that. So there's more of that is happening, and it is very underground, and people are very hush-hush about it. For Villa Torlonia, which is where Rutgers took some of the sample of the bones for it, um, actually just two months ago, maybe something like that, an Israeli organization called Zaka um, uh, is responsible for burying uh, the dead. Uh, if there's a, any kind of bomb or explosion or anything else, Zaka is the organization that goes and gathers the bodies and gives them a decent burial. So Zaka has now gone into the Villa Torlonia catacombs, and they've taken all the graves and poured concrete over all of them. Um, to completely, to cover the bones absolutely completely, to give them a, a decent burial. Um, so while one can understand this from a religious perspective, it's very sad from a scientific perspective because now we can't access that material and we can never do that research. It's a great loss. Yes, um, thank you. There is a catacomb uh, out on the Apian Way. Mm -hmm a Christian catacomb mm -hmm. that has a burial in it, which is a facsimile of a young 15-year-old girl. Yes. Do you know it? Um, there are about 12 catacombs out on the Appian Way. When you say a facsimile, what do you mean? There's one well, that has an open grave that's kind of covered over with a plastic top. And it could not her. be a body, obviously. Oh, I think it I know what you're talking about. Is it the, it's um, Shishilia in the Catacombs of Calixtus, and yes. she's, she's lying yes. on her side? On her right side. She's lying on her right she's side. She's about 15. 15 years she old. She was mortared. Yes. And she's got her hands tied behind her back yes. and her fingers and that. And it's it's, you can see the executioner's mark on her throat. Exactly. Yes. 
glad we've both seen it. Yeah. Yeah. That one, I could say something about that. That's, uh, that's uh, it, I have actually a chapter in, in, um, in my first book, The Bone Gathers, about that image. That is, a, this is the catacombs of um, Calixtus. It's an image of uh, the early virgin martyr, although she was married. Uh, she, she was a married virgin. It can happen. Um, <laughs> Cecilia, uh, Cecilia, and the Pope at the time, and I think it was Paschal the first, um, kept having these dreams about where she was buried. And he goes down into the catacombs of Calixtus, and he digs, and he finds um, Cecilia's body. And it was completely incorrupt. Uh, so the story goes, and you could still see her exactly as the, the day when she was martyred, um, her body still there and beautifully intact. Um, and so her body was removed, the bones were removed, and they were taken over to the Church of Santa Cecilia in Trastevere, and she was inhumed there. And the um, great um, Renaissance sculptor Stefano Maderno made that image of what she looked like. And Maderno says he, had, he was an eyewitness to this beautifully incorrupt body of this virgin martyr. Um, and he makes the statue based on reality. So it's life size. And if you go into the church of Santa Cecilia, she's there at the center of the church. And if you go to the catacombs, there's the copy of the Moderno that's still in that site. So it's amazing. And, it, and it's, um, I, I, it's a very, very interesting case. So read that chapter in my book if you want to <laughs> know more about Cecilia and her cult. Yeah. I want to thank everybody for all the good questions. Nicola Denzi-Lewis, and okay.